Words are what makes us as humans so special. The ability to express our feelings, to share knowledge, to light up a room in laughter. But we now live in a time where ChatGPT can literally write us anything. So are we beginning to lose what makes us so special? Was the power of Shakespeare's words, to be or not to be, in just the words alone? To be or not to be. I think it was in the delivery. I don't think the power of our words will be lost, but instead, the way we deliver those words will become more important. Imagination or creative people are going to become more valuable than ever before. Today, I'm joined with Gil Bash, a globally recognized leader in healthcare communication. We talk about the importance of language, expression, and empathy in a post chat GPT world. The power of empathy is the catalyst often for imagination. When we feel empathy for people suffering, we yearn and struggle to tap into our imagination and find new solutions. We touch on the role of big tech in fixing a fundamentally broken healthcare system, and we end on a message and a need for a compassion in a time of immense global pain and suffering. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and please make sure you hit that follow button down below just to support the channel. I begin this episode by asking Gil about his journey and how it's shaped his appreciation for words. That's such an important question. First of all, let me dissect it. There's a few questions there. Let me dissect each one. We talked about um, empathy. We talked about journey. We talked about technology. And I think you're absolutely right to look at the nexus of the three. Our journeys, certainly psychodynamically, psychologically, emotionally, do sort of influence our thinking process. I'm going to talk about something I've, I've never, ever talked about before. I think it's more interesting for your audiences. It's such a special podcast program. You have great guests. Um, Thank you. Both of both of my parents, both of my parents died because of fear. On the death certificates, of course, it lists clinical clinical reasons. You know, one, my mother due to cancer, uterine cancer, and my father as a combination of of many many things, from Crohn's to Parkinson's dementia related issues. That's what the technical death certificate or you know, summaries are. But let me go back, because that really did influence my, my journey. The, the aspect is my, um, my mother had um, vaginal bleeding. She died in her, at 80. She had vaginal bleeding probably for about five, six years beforehand until she finally mentioned something to me. And um, she said that she was having menstrual bleeding in her 70s. And I uh, you know as just, you as a, as a physician soon to be know that Short of a miracle, um, a biblical miracle, that's probably not what was going on. And I asked her when was the last time she saw an OBGYN. She said, well, I haven't seen one since uh, menopause. There was no need. And I said, well, mom, you need to make an appointment with an OBGYN today. You know, let me know if you can't. Obviously, she was soon afterward diagnosed with um, a stage four um, uterine cancer. It needed tremendous intervention, probably too little too late in that case. So I'll put that case aside. But it was the fear for years that something could be wrong that inhibited her from asking a trusted health professional. My father is the same way. He was having very difficult GI-related symptoms and, uh, again, tried to hide that from everyone. And feeling that that was diminishing of his you know, aging journey, he really tried to avoid speaking about it until it was far too late. And that sort of set off a sort of a series of, of dominoes, medical dominoes that resulted in his death at 70. So the reason I bring this up is I was already in the health profession for many years and my family knew this and they knew I have a medical background. You, you can see how fear or embarrassment of, of health conditions as they appear um, inhibit people from getting the help they need. So that's one chapter of this. The reality is with empathy is um, empathy is, is a personal choice to open up your heart. You know, many doctors to steal themselves as they deal with what's going on on the floor or in their, in their practice tend to look at the person as a collection of symptoms as opposed to the person. Uh, and we also create in personal words, patient. They're always people, sometimes a patient, but they're always people. And doctors 
obviously have always felt that they needed to separate themselves, whether it was the white coat, the stethoscope around their neck, to express a, a sense of authority. So that's the background element of this, seeing this up close and personal, and then understanding everyone that we meet is going through some form of journey. Now, let me fast forward to technology. I've always been fascinated with technology. This is a podcast, but right to my right, I have all sorts of wonderful little toys, technological toys that have passed through generations. I have an Apple Newton. Most people won't know what that is. Of course, a Palm Pilot. I have a BlackBerry. Obviously, I have a, um, a virtual reality set here. I have all these toys that are around me. The reality is all of these toys do not replace human touch. They are Rather than virtual reality, they're extended reality. All of these tools are designed to take our potential and extend it to heal. And that's very, very unique because most people think that they're replacement tools. So I want to jump to something you were alluding to, which is the, you know, the rise of chat GPT. And a lot of the clinical studies that have appeared where people have consumers have reported they they actually prefer chat gpt to a physician the core premise or the what confronts us is technology versus physician well it's not neither this or that it's this and that ideally which really has to be deployed and and so what i find is for the the physician who sort of sees technology as an extension of their ability to serve humanity those are the finest physicians of today and tomorrow. Those that think it's a tool in place of, same with the consumer, in place of a physician, uh, it's short-sighted. It's short-sighted. And, and so the reason I think people like OpenAI or ChatGPT and asking their medical questions is what I referred to with my, my parents. It, it slices out the embarrassment factor. We can ask the machine, machine learning, we can ask the machine our questions without feeling inhibited by the answers. That's one element of it. We can feel that the machine is always there when our physician is often not available to us. And that's the other aspect of this. And to some extent, when we get into ChatGPT and this intelligent conversation, the, the machine's ability to keep on asking us questions to get to some form of potential answer is, is comforting because we feel we're in non-threatening conversation. I, I warn everybody who's listening <laughs> to our conversation not to think that ChatGPT is the answer or an answer. Trust me, there, there's, there is nothing better than a health professional who has an open heart and actually sees themselves also in a parallel journey to sustain and save their own life and other people's lives. So that's the background to all this. And what you just said, there's, said there's a lot to unpack. And you're talking about technology, I guess, traditionally ha having always been a conduit for communication, where, whether it is you pick up your phone, you call someone from across the world, or you simply write up a blog and post it on the internet. And I think we're seeing somewhat of a transition now with large language models. And so my question is, do you think we are at risk of losing what makes us human as experiences are augmented and the world becomes more and more digital? I mean, I'm not sure if you've seen the podcast with Lex Friedman and Mark Zuckerberg. They had an interview using the, the headset. Yes. Um, and it, it was fascinating and super interesting. So the question is, are we at risk of is losing what makes us human as the technology gets more and more advanced? I wouldn't answer the question in a generality. And when we say, are we at risk for losing what is human? Some people are at risk for losing what is human. Uh, and m many others aren't. And um, I, I actually do not think that technology will replace humanity. It will augment humanity's uh, skills and ability if used, used wisely and to its best potential. AI augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence. Augmented intelligence can complement someone who has that human dimension empathy skill and make them wiser, potentially faster, and bring down possibilities to a 
select few to consider in a diagnosis or a therapeutic approach. They are not replacements for a physician or health professional's humanity in wanting to heal or help that patient. The machine can give you information. So what you're getting with AI as in a clinical background is you're getting the benefit of once student physicians like yourself, soon to be a doctor, would travel with your chief resident to visit a patient and the chief resident would ask questions to test the knowledge of the student. And so you had to learn to think analytically and to develop some sense of, of broad thinking. The machine, AI, complements or accelerates that process, but it never replaces your ability to have analytic skills. The other aspect is machines seem to suddenly do a better job at consecutive thought thinking than humans. The difference between a human being is that we have a frontal lobe and we have a hippocampus that enable us to have consecutive thoughts. Machines can have second thoughts or consecutive thoughts if prompted, but humanity naturally was designed, our brain structure was designed to have consecutive thoughts. Machine doesn't naturally have consecutive thoughts of it could be this or this. So I I don't think humanity is going to get lost in technology. I think that humanity that, that surrenders its own intellectual capacity to a machine will in fact lose its um, humanity. It's almost like a skill that we will seek to sharpen. And I am concerned about that but I am not concerned that the machine will trump people. I think people yeah. people have so a, a special something that will always rise to the fore. In the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine, uh, the opening paragraph says that medicine is an exercise of our imagination. We enter another person's suffering to end it. And so when talking about AI, ChatGPT, and creativity being augmented. The question I ask you is, do you think this will inevitably end up being true for imagination also? Well, a lot of people are frightened of that. I have um, a child who's a writer and was bemoaning, like, what's the future of, of, of writing? And I sort of um, was very encouraging. I mean, OpenAI is an incredible tool. I once asked OpenAI to do a, you know, a 500-word biography of me I would say that the the person that they conjured up and the person who I think I am based on my history seem to have two different lives. And there's a, clearly another Gil Bash wandering out there <laughs> who um, I don't think I want to meet that person. Yeah. Um, so how does, how does the machine discern between fact? And the challenge is that, that the machine is taking all the information it can access it doesn't have the ability to say this is true and this is not true. Um, it doesn't have the ability to take nuance and context at this time, at this time. But with imagination, the reason I don't use the word as some people use artificial intelligence, I always say augmented intelligence. The machine, in theory, is processing other people's information, your information, my information. And from that collection of information, it it comes up with text or, 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 or decision. So I would say imagination will always trump the processing of information. The imagination is really where it begins. And I'll, I'll give a classic example, the famous story of Apollo 13, trying to get the, the astronauts back to Earth safely after the space capsule obviously malfunctioned. Could today a machine do that? Um, Maybe, Um, but I don't think so. I think what happened was a group of people came together and it wasn't just imagination, it was collaboration. And so can a machine collaborate with other machines? Question. Can a machine collaborate with other human beings or human beings? Question. Can human beings collaborate with human beings? Most certainly. So I think that medicine is truly a team sport. I'm not talking about the patient that you will soon have who exhibits high blood pressure and you want to lower it. And so you might prescribe a calcium channel block or whatever based on the person's 
history and what you think is best for that patient, that person. I think a machine can readily do that. But I think when you're looking at complex things, a machine can synthesize down to some possibilities. You have to make the decision. You have to decide what's best for that person emotionally and medically. A person is not just their clinical chemistry. They're also the response to all that. I'm not worried about imagination being overcome by the machine itself. But I will say this, that imagination or creative people are going to become more valuable than ever before. Because what we're going to see is a good segment of society will will rely or, or lean as a crutch on the machine, right? On AI or ChatGPT or Dolly 2 or Dolly 3. And there'll be people who rise above it who are cognitively so clear and sharp and their pattern recognition skills are so unique that they will trump machine. You mentioned Mark Zuckerberg from you know, from Meta before. I mean, his strength is his human processing, his pattern recognition skills are extraordinary. And so I don't think that that's going to go away. I think it's going to become a more value, valuable, valued currency in the evolution of the world. And I would also say that those people, organizations are going to chase after those people and, and try to bring them in because those people will actually be able to master the machine and trump the machine. The, the reality is the human imagination has something that the machine will not have. Unpredictability. It was, I, I believe, Naval Ravikant said that it's not enough to be smart, but actually what you want to be, the goal is cognitively clear. And it's exactly what we're talking about here. And uh, my next question to that, which I believe you've already answered, but it is, will the way we use words then become less important? I think the opposite, more important. I think much more important. And I, I, I would say that it's not just because people speak different languages around the world and therefore we have to be sensitive to nuance and tone and word choice. I think that the unpredictable aspect is how people respond to words. You talked about my writing. I wrote a piece about how the Ivy League schools in, in, in this country, I am worried for um, the future of this country, not because Ivy League schools don't punch out bright people, but I, I think that they're punching out cookie cutter people who have lost their analytic ability. They're not looking at things in context, nuance. Machines don't do that. People can do that. Now, your first question was about empathy, a term that's often been you know, referred when people are speaking about me. And I think it's because of consistency of behavior over an extended period of time it is kindness. People always say, Gil's so kind. You know, um, and, um, and some people have even said, how can he be genuine? Nobody can be that kind. Uh, uh, people have said that to me before. I've heard that before. Well, the reality is I think that cognitive awareness or mindfulness, mindfulness, being present in the now with people and, um, and opening up our hearts to what other people are experiencing and communicating through that lens is not going to be a rarity. I think it's going to be almost like the the gem we seek out in other people. And I think that the greatest doctors that I think of today, and I think of many great doctors, and I think we have many great physicians in the world, I'm, I'm confident you're asking these questions, sets you up to be one of those great physicians in the world. But I think the greatest physicians that I encounter, it's not just their amazing clinical knowledge and skill, it's their humanity and their vulnerability that make them the big, fuller package. And we talked about someone who's going to be on your show who's, you know, fellow, you know, Brit. Um, he volunteers or consults with the National Health Service. He's still a physician. And he's um, Merck's uh, chief um, research officer, Dr. Janae Bawa. Um, he's one of those types of people, right? He has great humanity, and he has great clinical skill. Those are the superheroes of tomorrow in, in health. I'm confident we're going to be producing more and more because I think that those people will see the machine as an extension of their desire and ability 
to heal, it is not a replacement for them, for you. And, and just to actually quote Junaid, he, um, he had a fascinating panel discussion, which I'll be leaving as a link in the description for anyone that wants to check it out. And he spoke about how diversity is a fuel for innovation. And it's not just a moral obligation amongst everyone, but it's actually a necessity because we're, we're needing to leverage our lived experiences to articulate the most challenging problems around us to solve the greatest barriers in humanity's progress. And it, it did get me thinking around diversity and what is needed for a better healthcare system in the future. And it, it also got me a little bit worried because I did some reflection around the lack of medical school teaching. The doctors of tomorrow aren't learning anything about digital health, AI, and it's worrying. And so how can we kind of expect this diversity as a fuel for innovation when the doctors of tomorrow aren't getting that exposure? So w what's your perspective on this, Gil? First of all, it's such a critical question. Um, and it should be asked of, of all your guests and asked throughout the medical system. There is so much new technology, complex and simple, that's coming online. Remote patient monitoring, simple technologies, whether it's cellular or wireless or both, simple technologies. The use of telemedicine, simple technology. MCAT um, EKG reads for arrhythmia, relatively simple technology. We've been looking at Holter monitors and the earlier tools for, I don't know, 40 years. Simple technology uh, of ways of, of caring for, for people from their homes. The, the, the challenge is that health professionals, physicians, don't even get a full course on technology during medical school. Uh, they're assumed that they'll learn it from their older peers or that they've come in because it's a generation that was weaned on iPads and laptops and you know, you know, you know, wearables and gadgets and gizmos that you'll pick it up as you go along. But that doesn't prepare the physician to also be a teacher of the people who sit across from them and talk about why they want to be in touch. The other aspect that I think it's not just technology or, or the or the physician health professional's desire or willingness, it's the system's ability to support them. If the doctor or the office staff have to explain to, to a person, a patient, how to use the technology, who, um, who pays for that in a way in terms of time? You know, the you know, health professionals have to bill for their time or account for their time. In, in the NHS system, NHS doesn't have a PL. It centers around the patient. In this country, it's a fee-for-service system. It's a very fragmented health ecosystem here, horribly. Um, but the doctor is not well equipped, and some doctors are uncomfortable with technology. But that's a problem. That diminishes patient care. And I want to give a great example. There's a, a great doctor. She's a, an internist and hematologist. Her name is Alana Yurkovitz. She's at Stanford. She's written a book. I love the book called Fragmented. It's called A Doctor's Quest to Piece Together the American American Healthcare. And then um, there's another book by Gita Neal called Dead Wrong. It's amazing that all these books are coming out about how screwed up the, the healthcare system is. The poor physician and, and their support team are plopped into that system. And they're expected to swim in a sea of sharks, of technological sharks, with no training whatsoever. Um, they, the EMRs that are created in this country aren't really developed for the user. They're developed for the technologist. Um, <laughs> we've got a lot to fix here, but we will fix it because people are talking about the problem and they're talking about how this problem diminishes people's care. So I do think that you and your colleagues need far more support. Your passion to be physicians is inspiring. Is the system supporting you? Do the people who teach you have the skills themselves of how to incorporate technology into care? I don't know. But I would say get some technology gurus who are really passionate about this topic to come into medical schools or at least give you, I'd say, if not a semester one course, at least give you some sort of mini course of, of how to navigate the world. The reason I started this podcast was to address that very topic we're discussing now was the fact that there is that lack of teaching in medical school, the lack of 
inspiration around creativity. And um, you spoke about Dr. Gita Nea, who's recently um, released her book, Dead Wrong. She wrote a fantastic first chapter, which is free for anyone to read. And if you want to check out the full book, you can also order it on Amazon. And she st spoke about Amazing, you got it there. <laughs> she spoke about the stark challenges in, in healthcare, the fragmentation, and also she was highlighting a resistance to change. And the question I'm going to pose to you, which is probably going to be a very difficult question for you to answer, Gil, but how do we fix a system that is fundamentally just resistant to that change? It's a, it's a really loaded question. And I think that part of it is the, the system is so weighted with policies and legal implications and risk. And so the reason doctors are resistant to change is that they're individually fearful of bucking the system. So the, the challenge we, we, we have in terms of resistance to change is that physicians and people are fearful of new, of change. You know, and who's going to be the first person to do this, there's a great video I recommend all the listeners go to. It's called the, the the Crazy Leader. It's on YouTube. It's about a guy who starts dancing in like a, a music festival without his shirt, and he's just dancing. Everybody's sitting there, their blanket. He's dancing away, and and nobody's paying attention to him. Suddenly, the second person gets up and he starts dancing next to the first person, and then people start to get up and dance. And they talked about the second person is really the leader. The first person's kind of the wacko. The second person's the leader. It's a great video. I highly recommend it. Medicine is like that. Medicine, medicine is in search of its second person to get up and dance to the music. There are a couple obstacles that is that are stopping the the healthcare system moving away from the sick care model into, I guess, a healthcare model. And whether that is accessibility, trust disparity, racial inequity, there are some significant hurdles that are probably for a different podcast episode. And you spoke a little bit about um, a need for a second leader, not the first wacko coming in, shouting all these crazy ideas, everyone looking at them a bit funny, but actually someone to pick up on that idea and take it to the next level. And I perceive that second leader should be big tech and big tech corporations coming in and kind of alleviating this puzzle and fixing this healthcare system. So give me your perspective on this, Gil. I love that. You know, I, I wrote about that a few years back and I said, just watch Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon. I had the privilege um, at, at Health Without Vowels uh, just a few weeks ago of doing an exclusive uh, conversation with, uh, with Amazon One Medical's four chief medical officers, two and two from the organization. And when um, Amazon acquired One Medical, I said, a lot of people were saying, this is game changing. And I said, I wrote a, a contrarian article and I said, no, it's not game changing, it's learning. Amazon is now investing heavily and in learning what makes the um, U.S. health system tick because they have a tremendous amount of understanding on supply chain management, on consumer preference, and they're trying to figure out how to apply that to the broken medical system. And so they invited me to, to meet with them. I wrote a piece that's gone viral. Um, you can find it on Medica, M-E-D-I-K-A dot life, uh, the Amazon One Medical interview. And what I do believe is that right now, the big tech companies are morphing. They understand consumer desire. Um, they understand keeping it simple and accessible. They understand um, inventing things that people want. I use the word inventing, not invention, innovation. Inventing is what, what these companies do with a keen eye to make it innovative. When you want it, when you and all your physician colleagues want it, then it's an innovation. Until then, it's just an invention. It's a figment of someone's imagination, not yet embraced by the system. They know how to connect those dots. I don't think the medical system specifically knows how to connect those dots. So back to Amazon and One Medical, an example. One Medical has about, I think, about 130 different locations. But what it has more so is its 24-7 um, you know, sort of connect with the physician system. And Amazon's going to look to connect all of this together 
and understand consumer behavior and desire and the physician's ability to deliver and begin to perfect its systems. I think that Microsoft is starting to get in the game as well. I'm, I'm, I hope Microsoft is saying, we understand coding. We understand how to keep it simple. You, you like Word, you like PowerPoint, you like Excel. I like Excel a little less. Um, but but um, you, you, you like our tools. Um, well, guess what? We'll conjure up an electronic medical system that um, is intuitive. Like Google Docs is probably saying, how do we create something that is highly searchable and and easy to use? So I, I do think that big tech is is giving a lot of thought to this. Here's the problem. Health in this country, at least, we can talk about other nations. Health in this country is a, is, is a jungle um, with alligators and, and, um, and, and boa constrictors. And whenever these big tech companies say, well, this isn't working, this is stupid, we'll come in and fix it. What they find is culture, the culture of the medical system crushes um, change every time. Medical community globally, nationally, is a distinct thinking process culture. And whenever you try to confront that culture, no matter how logical that confrontation is, those companies have lost. And I think that's why companies like Amazon and One Medical are going slow, fast. They're seeking to learn, 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 and apply. That's key. I think that all of the big tech companies have a mega role to play. And I, th I hope, for the sake of, back to the original question, humanity and empathy, I would love it. I think that, that America would stand and applaud if somehow or another these big tech companies and the big health tech companies like the like Epic of the world would say, how do we work together to make this better and better and better as opposed to how do we make this a proprietary system that everybody has and you're kind of, you're going to be stuck with. Um, I think that's the challenge of how to create win, win, win for the, the companies involved so that society can win. But no doubt about it, you're spot on. Big tech is going to be here. May take them a little longer than we'd like, but but they're coming and they realize for many reasons they have the talent, they have the tools, and guess what? It's a colossal market and they all want a piece of it. We, we spoke earlier about what makes humans special and we talk, spoke a little bit about humans ability to collaborate and that's what we really need well right global collaboration there i think the closest we've seen to that is when elon musk and um a couple other leaders came together and called for a pause in ai due to regulatory fears that was probably the closest we got to kind of different people from around the world with different sorts of power coming together all for a global effort um and i guess it, that that is needed when talking about AI because the societal decisions around what is an acceptable level of regulation for AI and the trade-offs will be different geographically, for example, where the data come from, who it's trained for. Um, but something that got me quite sad is it's sad that these leaders are able to come together from all around the world to discuss AI. But at the moment, there is a crisis happening in the Middle East with the conflict between Gaza and Israel and humanity actually could not be further from divided and the world is currently in pain and hurting at the moment and just as we touch up and close on this podcast Gil I, I, I want to touch on this global collaboration that is needed but before we get that global collaboration we need to actually find a way to fix humanity and get humanity to come together I'm glad I'm glad you you referenced this this is um uh, there's great tragedy going on there right now. And it, you're, you're touching on something I mentioned earlier, which is uh, consecutive thoughts, which is uh, the pain of one people, feeling for the pain of one people doesn't neglate, neg 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 negate our ability to feel for the other. And they're not mutually exclusive. And, um, and they ha they has to be resolved for, the, for their sake. For their sake. I don't believe that people in Israel... Um, want this to go on sort of generation after generation. I don't think uh, people of Palestine want this to go on generation of generation. We talk about empathy. We can, we can open our hearts to be a little more expansive here. And, 
and that leads us to solution. Now, I, I have thought of the, the famed uh, Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, where um, bold leaders from the Protestant and Catholic communities came together, and they realized after generations our endless cycle of violence between Protestants and Catholics just leads to an endless cycle of violence. It, it must end. It must end. We must come to some form of mutual agreement and then have that happen. What happened, though, is they had behind them very strong, objective, trusted leaders who led the discussion process. Um, obviously, um, in UK's Tony Blair being one of the two leaders that was involved in crafting that agreement and getting the players to sign. And an exhaustion on the part of the people to shift away from hate to hope, the hope that they could live together in some way, shape, or form and create a, a country together that lived uh, not in love necessarily, but could live in some form of comfortable side-by-side -side peace. And and so, you know, I I read the news reports there very closely, and I'm saying to myself, where is the conversation that goes on that says, after this this new cycle or chapter of violence comes to some form of close, how, how do we bring people together to create something that is um, fair, fair, comp compromise, and can can ensure that the people of Palestine can can start to build institutions of a country, and the people of Israel can feel secure and safe within their borders. Um, and this is really the core, I think, the one of the greatest tools that is yet to be mined, and you began this conversation with, which is the power of empathy. The power of empathy is the catalyst, often, for imagination. When we feel empathy for people suffering, we yearn and struggle to tap into our imagination and find new solutions. I know many people would disagree with me from both sides of the equation and from the middle. But I would say whenever I see suffering, I, I wish to engage and I yearn for a place where um, people can live their fullest potential in harmony, in safety, in security. And, um, and I do think that we should stop trying to justify one or the other. Um, I, I think at this case, in this aspect, we, we have to understand that this cycle of violence must come to a, cl to a closure um, at, at some point. And then, and then what? And I look at all the protests around the world this way and that way, and I say, why isn't anybody protesting not for their side, but protesting for peace? Um, and, and not saying what sort of peace and not justifying who's right or who's wrong. Just saying, I yearn for peace for these people. So to some extent, that's when I say I yearn for healing um, as, a, as someone involved in the healing process. I, I yearn for healing. When I go and see people, um, I do see their humanity. I do see race. I do see religion. I do see background. I'm not blind to that. And I embrace all of it. I embrace all of it. I see people's differentiation. That's what makes this planet so amazing and worth fighting for. One question we didn't get into, you wasn't on the question list. I'll just, uh, I'll leave you with a f thought. While we're talking about human health and technology, I, I ask you to consider and the listeners to consider the sustainability of our planet. This planet doesn't need people. People need the planet. Fantastic. Gil, this has been a super impactful, meaningful, and important conversation. And I thank you so much for coming on and joining me. I'm honored to be there. And I just want to tell the listeners, if this is the first time you're tuning in to the podcast, um, Ash has amazing guests. I'm impressed with every single one. Uh, a lot of people who I admire, our friends from around the world, are featured here. So it's this is one of these, stay tuned, stay tuned and, and listen in. Great conversations. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you very much, Gil. Thanks for getting to the end of the episode. Please consider leaving a review on iTunes and subscribing on YouTube. It really helps the channel to grow and means the world to me. Until next time and see you soon.